So the tensor rings, it was, uh, and you guys heard a few of us talk about Slim Sperling. So Slim Sperling, he was actually from South Dakota as well. And he rediscovered this technology in the early 90s. It was Slim and a bunch of his friends. They, um, they worked with um, these sacred measures that came from the Great Pyramids. And so there was this uh, gentleman who discovered all these measurements above the king's chamber. And as they were playing with these measurements, they found one of these specific measurements was actually the sine wave of the hydrogen atom. That was really cool. So you can actually cut um, any kind of a rod or a dowel or anything to these specific measurements, and it emits the frequency of hydrogen. And that is super cool. But then he found that there was these measurements that when you cut something to that very specific measurement to the hundred thousandths of a centimeter, and you bring the ends together, it was creating a what they called a light. They could see a light coming out of here. But it was a dualistic nature. One side of this circle would be a positive, and one side would be a negative, so to speak. One would be more life-affirming, and one would be more non-beneficial. You know, so um, Slim found that if you take wire and you twist it in a clockwise fashion, that it was then creating a positive on both sides. So how we make a tensor ring is um, copper itself is a microcrystal. And when they draw a copper wire, it aligns all the crystalline structure in that copper wire. And it creates what's known as a piezoelectric energy flow. That's where, you know, crystals, crystals are em emitting a piezoelectric energy. So within the copper wire, there is that energy flow. So we fold the wire in half, we twist it, we cut it to that hundred thousandths of a centimeter, and we bring the ends together. So that way, it is creating a flow of energy one way and the other way both. So it is a counter-rotating vortex. This creates a vortex of light, a column of light. And with the, the frequencies that came from the Great Pyramids, one of those cubit measures, out of all those different measurements, only one of them made a working tensor ring. The rest of them you just use in these straight line measurements. So this tensor ring, when uh, Slim first discovered this, they were using an oscillator. Um, gosh, I think that's the name of it. It is a tool that finds the frequency. They found that the frequency of those first rings were 144,000. Uh, 144 megahertz is what the frequency of those first tensor rings were. And they did a lot of research and study. I mean, he even got the military involved with this. And the military actually wanted nothing to do with it because where this creates a light that goes for miles, you cannot send anything negative through this column. So the military could not weaponize tensor technology. So they wanted nothing to do with it. Um, because again, it is a, it's a vortex. It's a, it's a toroidal field. So we were talking about the torus, where it spins both ways. This is kind of like a torus too. Um, in that it does spin both ways. Um, so Slim worked with a, mathematici a mathematician who um, he figured out another frequency based on the sacred measurements, and that one was 177 megahertz. Um, then through the years, we worked with dowsers from all over, and these dowsers have helped us find different measurements. Um, some of the other measurements that we found were one that produces a 333 megahertz. And this one, um, we found that we believe that it came from the, the Temple of Solomon. Um, and so that specific measurement that was used for that temple work produces that 333 megahertz frequency. And those you can even cut in a straight line measurement too. And it also still produces a 333 megahertz frequency. It's kind of like a ham radio. Ham radios, they cut to a specific length, the antennas, and then that antenna creates the frequency. Um, but tensor rings are a way different critter in that you just can't be like, okay, I want to make a 432 megahertz ring, and you cut to a measurement. It doesn't work that way. Um, there have, for these sacred measures, it's, it's thought that there have been 64 cubit measures. These are called cubits, these measurements known to mankind, but very few of them will actually create a working tensor field or even a, um, an energetic when cut to a, a straight line measurement. So 
The other measurements that we found were, let's see, the, besides the 333 megahertz, the 188 megahertz, then we found a 764 megahertz, which was just a whole nether ring that was a dual ring that has a black hole on one side and it creates this tornado on the other side. We can never figure out what it was. We talked to Slim and he said it was for teleportation and we never have quite figured that one out. Um, but uh, so, so Slim, going back to this, is that Slim Sperling, he died in 2007. And um, after Slim passed, he started to appear to people all over. And people would be like, yeah, there's this really tall, red-headed dude with a beard that keeps showing me this copper ring over water, you know. And um, so it's been really interesting to run into those people where Slim, you know, appears to them. But uh, so this was in 2010 that my sister actually channeled um, the Earth Elementals. So my, so my sister and the Elders Three... It was, yeah, it was about 2010, or it was 2011, that um, my sister channeled in this, this shape. You might know it as the Triscalian or the Triscale. And um, when she, she drew it, and um, we called it Hedica. And Hedica is the name of the spirit of water. And so as this Hedica came through, um, it was phenomenal. I could not feel energy before we started making these hedicas. I started making these hedicas, and it is what broke me open to feeling energy was these triscales or hedicas. Um, and we'll talk more about the earth elementals here later, but when I was getting these out into the world, I was super excited. I'd make hundreds of these driving down the road, you know, driving with my knees, you know. But we live in South Dakota where we have four lanes and we're the only one on the road, so it's, it's all good. It's not like I drive through Denver. So um, this was before cell phones, you know. So, um, so the Hedekas, um, as we was getting them out into the world, we ran into all kinds of people who were like, I've been drawing that symbol since I was a kid. Or else, hey, check out my tattoo. And they have it tattooed on their body. Um, there was fishermen on the East Coast who had been making these for decades, and they threw them in their holding tanks to keep the fish alive longer. Um, so there, there was so much about this little symbol, especially made out of copper, but you can make it out of anything and it's going to emit the energy. Um, and what the channeled information was saying was that it, you know, it is the symbol of, of the spirit of water, and the spirit of water is older than the planet, you know, because it came here to support the planet. You go to other planets and there are different elementals than what are here. But um, so this spirit of water, um, you can drop it into soil and it promotes root growth 15 feet out. Um, it bounces the energetic, uh, it, well, it clears the energetics of water. It brings in more of the consciousness of water into your water, into the physical water. So the gals from Dancing with Water, the new science of water, had just written a book that came out in 2010. And they called me up and said, hey, all your channeled information backs our science on what this Hedica does. We call it Triscale. And so, you know, they were really fascinated with that whole concept. And then they called me two weeks later and said, well, there's this gentleman who sits on our front porch every night when we come home from work. We're scientists, you know, we don't channel or anything. But there's this gentleman who sits on our porch and his name is Slim Sperling and he has information on, for you on how to make tensor rings. So I got the information from them about tensor technology and started to work with Slim Sperling on the making of tensor rings. And through that time, and that was in 2010, through that time I've had the remembrances of creating these tools for lifetimes. So an interesting thing with these is that they, they do produce that, that field of energy, but where the true power and potency of these rings lies is in the higher dimensional tool. So where I had been creating these things for lifetimes, I wasn't creating rings, I was creating higher dimensional tools. So where our tools are at housed in this higher dimensional plane, they are housed in underneath of a pyramid, under a dome, there's all these master beings there. Our one guardian of these tools is named Heimdall. Heimdall, he's, um, if you've ever seen the movie Thor, he's that 
that really badass gatekeeper of the Rainbow Bridge with his sword, and he can see everything. And you know, so that's that's Heimdall. He is in that tradition of Thor and all those guys. Heimdall's an Arcturian, you know, which I guess that would make Thor and Odin Arcturians too. But um, so anyway, Heimdall is the guardian and protector of all of our Arthuric tools that we create here. So to give an example, um, once we started working with all the earth elementals, which I'll talk more about all the different earth elementals, we would take, um, we would ask them to be in the etheric templates. So then within this column of light, you can find the frequencies and properties and the consciousness of water, air, fire, ether, all of that is found in here. Um, so that's what we put into the etheric templates. And so this again is an antenna. So this antenna, even though it creates this beautiful tensor field and everything, again, the true power and potency lies in all of the consciousness that comes in here to assist. So you have the consciousness of water in here and of fire and all of that. Well, along the way, we kept getting hit with what we call energetic implants, etheric implants. They were things that would come in and, you know, maybe your shoulder would get dislocated or you feel like you had a pin in it or, you know, weird stuff like that on the physical. And my sister was always, um, you know, we always called her kind of like the canary in the coal mine because she would always get hit with all of these things and then we'd have to come in and try to clear them. So these energetic implants, you know, um, as they would come in and they would cause physical sensations and we would see them and we would see them, you know, like maybe an energetic rod stuck into your shoulder. Um, and so we would simply start clearing those out. And what that was is, is that as we raised in frequency and vibration, then those things started to be not in that same vibration and that's why we would find them. So some of these things, so let's step back and remember, so that we don't go into fear with this, that your soul is in charge of everything. That even any of these things that happen to us, our soul is the one that was like, yeah, cool, let's, let's do this. You know? So nothing happens to you that your soul does not agree on. You are not a victim and you know, that's, that's that, you're not a victim. So everything that happens, even in life, it is part of your soul path. And I know you guys all know this, um, but just a reminder so that anything that, you know, we talk about today that you don't fall into fear about this because it, it's, it's part of a greater thing. Um, so some of these energetic implants, like what I had was where I had a sheath on a whole half of my left side and my soul put it there. And it was like a protector. Um, for me, and so it had been there for lifetimes. And then as I started to grow in frequency and vibration, then we'd find all these things and we'd clear them. So for many years, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and if I didn't have an energetic implant, I was like, man, I must not have raised in frequency and vibration last night, what's up? <laughs> you know, and so it was just all the time. And so I was like, okay, there has to be a way to clear these energetic implants. So I went to one of my favorite crystal shops and I said, okay, what kind of things can clear an energetic implant? And so she gave me this whole long list of crystals and I bought all these crystals. And um, because actually right before that, my sister, I was making one of these tensor rings for her singing bowl, her crystal singing bowl. So I was told to make a ring for her and I was told to put the energetics of water into it. So we twist up this wire and I would sit there with this whole 20, 30 foot long piece of copper wire and I would run it underwater physically in the sink and just because that was my way that I could at the time put the energetics of water into the copper was actually running it underwater with the intention of bringing through the frequencies of water into the copper and it was really fun because we noticed that it actually made the copper harder. It hardened up the crystal structure of the copper by putting the energetics of water into it. And so it affected the physical. And we're like, wow, that is just, you know, that's super cool. And so then still above the sink in the back shop, I have that whole list of crystals. Because at first then I took the crystals, this whole handfuls, and run water and no crystals. And I had somebody else drag the copper wire across there. And we were putting the energetics of all the crystals and the water into that copper wire. And um, 
and we were like, God, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And it was, you know, and just because that was what we had to do at first. So it was the intention. So then I kept that list of the crystals and the water, and it was just my intention to bring those into the copper. So then that could help us to clear energetic implants on the body because we're bringing the frequencies and properties of the copper into it. Then we discovered the etheric templates. That is where they are up here housed and guarded in that dome pyramid. And so that's where we in earnest really started to work with the tools is creating all those etheric templates. So then it was just game on. We started to put everything that we learned in there, whether it was clearing soul shards, you know, um, or doing the release of, you know, anything. So anything that my sister and I learned along the way, we put into the etheric templates so that anybody could access that here. Now, going back to the tensor rings, and we were doing, um, we were, dowsers were bringing in the different measurements for us. So we had five or six measures. But then our friend Marty Lucas, some of you guys might know Marty Lucas in radionics. Um, Marty and Scott Ertle actually were dowsing one day to find a measurement that would be beneficial for dairy cows. They came up with this measurement that was the galactic ring. And we, so it was, it was, we just called it the galactic ring. That ring was super special. It did not have a single frequency in it, like 177 megahertz, anything like that. It had multiple frequencies in multiple fields. And interesting thing was is that when you hold it, we could see that there were other soul aspects of you. And this was my first experience with soul aspects, other incarnations of me that were right here at the same time I was holding on to this, I could see that there was 12 of us right here holding on to this ring. And that was super cool because it was bringing more of us in. And so then it came to be that there was all those frequencies and properties in the ring and we started putting everything in there. But we were seeing that it was the soul that determined what frequencies and properties come through. So you could not get a static measurement on what frequency was coming out of that ring. It would contain all the frequencies before, like the 144 megahertz, the 177, all the frequencies and properties of the crystal kingdom, all the plant kingdom, all the earth elementals, and then all the different modalities that we learned along the way we put in there. And then it was just so busy in there, but it was like a smart ring in that your soul is the one who determines what comes through for you at any given time. So it is always different. So that galactic ascension ring, we called it, was our first smart ring, basically. And that, that was a huge step. And then it, things just kept going after that. We found um, there was a gentleman, uh, Scott Miller, who uh, just recently passed, but he helped to bring in the um, standard Teotihuacan unit. It's short, STU for short. It is a measurement that was used to build the city of Teotihuacan and other megalithic structures on the planet. And so that sacred measurement we called the balance and harmony ring. And that was a phenomenal ring because we just kept adding more stuff energetically, etherically into that ring. And then the next huge step was the golden fire. Um, so the, well, I'm not sure whether to talk about the golden fire yet or not. Yeah, I guess we will. So the golden fire is the sacred heart. We have the sacred space of the heart that we moved into, but then there's the sacred heart. The sacred heart is what you always see Jesus and Mary depicted with, that trifold gold flame heart. That's the sacred heart. We were with our friend Jeanette Crowley, not related to Alistair Crowley. She's the one who wrote The Eagle and the Condor. She does Soul Body Fusion as her other book and her modality. Um, she's out of Colorado, but we were doing um, a workshop with her and it was three years ago. Actually, we're just having a three-year anniversary sale on the Golden Fire tools right now. So it was uh, three years ago that we were on our way back from this workshop. And, um, well, okay. At the workshop, um, this Jeanette, she channels an energy group called Mark. They're from the Great White Brotherhood. They're just, um, she's been mapping out dimensions of consciousness for 36 years. And um, so it's all about expanding consciousness and working through the dimensions of consciousness. And um, so working with her, I heard Mark come in and tell Brenda to stand in the back of the room to hold space. And I saw Brenda get up. She went in the back of the room, held space. 
we were taking a journey that day where we took the Pope's keys, the gold and the silver key. We went to the gates of heaven. We said, we have the key. We went through. You're not supposed to go through unless you are, you're not supposed to go through while you're incarnate. We went through. We had the silver key. We said, we have the key. We went through. We ran into a third gate, a big red fiery gate and a big red fiery dragon garden. It. Oh, that must be the gates of hell. Well, we don't have a key, so we are the key. We went through that third gate and we received the sacred heart activation. And that was huge. Um, so once that golden fiery heart came in, it's like Christ consciousness. Um, and this has not been active in the human for who knows how long, maybe never. Um, who knows? But anyway, so this golden fire came through. And so then on the way home, um, we were like, okay, we want to make a ring with this. We want to bring this energy out so everybody can access this. And so, um, so it was really cool because there was this being on the way home, you know, we'd do my best work driving. My sister was with me and this being came out and he showed us this long golden rod. And we sat there and we started guessing the measurement in millimeters and finally we guessed it right, you know. And then after we guessed it right, then he grabbed that rod and he brought it into a circle and it became this blue neon circle. And um, that was where the etheric template of the golden fire first came through. So then the golden fire rings um, that are cut to that specific measure and connected to that etheric template of the golden fire, when a ghost or a wayward or, okay, so any being comes into this field, the soul comes in to activate the sacred heart because it's your soul that activates your sacred heart. So a ghost or a wayward would step into this column his soul would come in to activate the sacred heart and just take it home. Simple as that. You didn't have to talk it into going. You didn't have to do the healing work with it, anything. It would just go. And so that was a huge thing for us, um, the golden fire. So that was our, our next ring. To go on about the tensor rings and the newer frequencies and where we are going out with consciousness. So we found that chalice energy that I was speaking about about a, almost a year ago a little bit less, and that chalice energy is in these rings. And basically, some of the work that we're gonna be doing here at the very end of the day is bringing in that chalice to where we are the chalice as our physical body, and our soul is gonna bring that energy in, and that's gonna allow us to do some really fun stuff on, like I said, uncreating creation. Then um, one of the newer rings is the harmonizer ring. And this one, so if we consider that this is an electromagnetic universe, everything has an electromagnetic field. We were talking about the toruses, and the toruses create an electromagnetic field. And so everything in physical reality is an electromagnetic field. And so electromagnetics inherently are not good or bad. Um, actually, inherently, they are good. So this ring here, this harmonizer ring, exists between this whole plane of electromagnetics and frequency and light, all of that is here in this certain plane. We get above this dimensional cloud layer space and we get into this space where it's just pure consciousness. There's no light, there's no electromagnetics, it's just, it's just pure consciousness. And that is where we begin um, as a soul. Um, so this acts as like it sits right up there on that ceiling and I call it a cosmic blender because it, it looks like a blender where it is taking all of that which is non-physical, non-electromagnetic and it is basically anchoring it into the things that are physical and electromagnetic. So it just brings it all together. And so um, when we use it with the other rings, it, it brings it more into the physical. This third ring of this trio, which we call the alchemist set, which is you know, the same as a lot of the pendants some of us are wearing, it has those three different rings, which we call the alchemist set, which is sum of greater than the whole. But this other one is the divine I am. And this is, the divine I am is simply the energy of the soul. And so this is gonna feel different to every person because it is you, it is your soul, it is your light that is in here. Um, and we're going to do some playing with the large sets of rings and we're going to scan each other and do chakra alignments and all the fun stuff with those here in a minute. But um, so I just wanted to bring this up because this is part of 
the consciousness work that we do. And that is, um, you know, because my passion is going way out, you know, going as far as I can and then bringing it in and putting it into the tools to make it accessible for other people. So that's, you know, that's why the tools is a part of, of what we teach and what we do and the consciousness work that we do is because we anchor all of that into the physical tools. You know, you always hear about people talking about holding space and you hear about sacred space and, and all of that. So it's um, part of the analogy is with these rings in that the older rings, like the 144 megahertz ring, they would, they would hold a space. And that's what I call these as space holders in that within those columns of frequency, there's, there's a certain field, a certain energetic field. And some of them contain more than others. Like our older rings don't contain the consciousness of the earth elementals or of all the plant crystal kingdoms, all that stuff. So that was one space that you could hold that was, it's a, harmo it's a harmonious space. And that is why these tools work so well is that it is creating a, um, a coherency to everything. And that's why they work with electromagnetics is that they are bringing a coherency to an electromagnetic field. That is the only reason that some electromagnetics are non-beneficial to our electromagnetic being is because a cell phone or other man-made things, electromagnetic fields, are disharmonious. And as they come in, they affect us. And so that's why we make like cell phone tabs because they are taking, the tensor fields are taking a disharmonious field and they are harmonizing it to be a more beneficial field. I sleep with my cell phone next to me at night and I'm pretty sensitive to these things, to electromagnetics and frequencies um, because it harmonizes them. But anymore, I don't even need that cell phone tab. I just kind of have it to show because I've got my body and trained in my mind knowing that I don't, you know, that I can handle this on my own, that my field is strong enough, that I stand in my power enough that these things don't affect me. Again, these are training wheels for us. Um, it's not meant to be reliant upon them, um, you know, for a long time. That is what she does is she holds space and she holds such a high space that things happen and shift because it's just like a tensor ring. If you stand in one of these large rings, it is going to bring you into alignment. I mean, we've done uh, biofeedback studies like with a cell tab. It aligns chakras, energy bodies, makes organs function better, clears the mental and emotional fields, all of that on biofeedback. Of course, we see it doing a lot more, you know, spiritually with the soul and everything. So basically when you stand within this field, this space, it harmonizes everything here in the physical, mental, emotional, everything that the human is. He, he discovered that um, there was the original eight cells of anything biological. And those original eight cells, as they come together, they create this geometry. And this is how he interpreted it, is in this specific geometry. Uh, and they call it a Genesa crystal. And it's just basically four rings that are interwoven into the shape. And they're fun because you can collapse them and wear them as bracelets and all kinds of fun stuff. But where a tensor ring creates a column of light, when you put it into here, I coined this thing a tensor field generator because it basically creates a sunshine effect and sends that out. Now, this one is in that golden fire frequency. So this is the one that is, um, well, it creates a two and a half mile wide sphere of influence, about two and three quarters actually. And so within that sphere of influence, this is restructuring all the electromagnetics, all the, you know, all the electromagnetics that are floating through the air, dense consciousness, all the ghost waywards, all of that stuff. This particular object here, when we first made this, um, Slim was showing us that one, it was working on GMOs, genetically modified organisms, such as corn, that um, basically you can take seeds of a GMO plant and you can expose them to this energetics and then that seed when it turns into a plant it has no GMO. It has basically gone back to its original DNA in the highest and best. So then if you have seedlings 
the seedlings that are from a GMO seed, if you expose that to this energy, then by the time that plant reaches fruition, the seeds are back to normal natural. So there is a way, because I know that I fell into fear for a little while about the whole thing with the kill gene and the GMO stuff and all that, you know, with the corn. And um, it's, for, for one, we see that over the course of seven years, it goes back, it reverts back to the natural anyway. Because every, everything is, you know, the natural world and Gaia are very powerful, powerful things. And it will bring all that GMO back if we just let it be. Um, but we can change it. So the reason that I want to introduce you to this is because also this is in those columns of light. That when you anchor these columns of light into a cornfield, it is going to shift that. And remember, these columns of light will stay there indefinitely if needed. So anchoring columns of light everywhere is huge, huge, huge. Uh, because it connects into the core of the earth. You know, Gaia is very much holding these columns of light. And, um, and, and so it, every time we anchor a column of light, it is raising that light quotient of the entire planet. It truly is. It's an amazing thing. So anyway, the energetics of this goes in there. And this was also one that is, um, he showed us creates rain. When we sat the first prototype down, um, we felt it going out in waves and we could feel rain on our skin and you could smell that, smell the rain, the negative ions. Um, it was really super cool. And this one was just made again recently because the, the other one I sat on a medicine wheel, um, one of the sacred sites there in South Dakota. And it, uh, it stayed there and then we never did make any more of them, but we did create these energetically that we just energetically throw them into cornfields. But now then, once you are basically attuned to this, I'm just saying this so that you know it, so that when we go to anchor those columns of light, this will come through in there too. Is that energetics that can shift GMOs and maybe create rain. Actually, one of the rings that we created here a couple years ago, we call the regeneration ring. And this little ring right here, the regeneration ring, this frequency, is one that we first started to see things being anchored more into the physical than what we've ever seen before. And there's another tool out that sits out there. It is called the Cosmic Sun Disk, but it is a torus. This torus, it's not the bull torus, it's the tube torus. So this has a seed of life the six petals. It has another seed of life, the six petals, but it's ratcheted, so it creates 12 petals. This was also a crop circle in 2009, which is really cool because I think this came out in 2008, if I remember right. Um, so this creates that true tube torus, that toroidal field that goes both ways and it spins. Um, this was made with those regeneration rings. And I, I always tell the story that I slept with this right above my head at night. I woke up the next day and I swear I sprained my pineal gland because it felt like it grew in size and I had a splitting headache and it was just, yeah, <laughs> totally. And, um, but it's bringing it into the physical. So it's bringing all those higher torsion fields, all those higher Merkaba fields. It's bringing all of that into the physical and it is anchoring it into our physical cells. These are third templates that we found um, that my sister helped me find that I, that I then had been creating for all these lifetimes. I started to find very few other people on the planet that were creating etheric templates or that had etheric templates that went to their tools. Very few. And, you know, in reality, that is truly the most powerful thing is not physical tools, but tools that are, exist in every plane as do we. That is why the tensor rings work so flipping well is because they are found in existence on all the planes that we are, all the frequencies. They're in the mental and emotional fields. They're on the physical, obviously. They're on the soul level. So they transcend throughout all of that. Well, we'll start here at the beginning. This is called the Golden Fire and Light Wand. At one time, we were trying to find dowsing rods. We were making dowsing rods for a person and these dowsing rods 
we want it to be something that we could do a lot of the work automatically. Because when I first started teaching dowsing, you know, I would teach about the way Slim Sperling did it, in that he would find geomagnetic lines that come into a building. And Slim would take these sacred measurements out of copper, and he would call them staples. And he would stick them into the ground. So we would use our dowsing rods, and we would find where these lines come into a building at. And we would put a staple in the ground, right on the edge of the wall or outside the building, and it would cause that geomagnetic line to bounce up and over or down and under the building, so it wouldn't go through the building. The reason that we did that was because geomagnetic lines can carry energy and information. So if you live downwind from a nuclear power plant or a really crappy part of the neighborhood where there's a lot of dense consciousness and energy, and that line comes through there, it is carrying that energy and information on that geomagnetic line. Maybe you step there and you just kind of feel, uh, you know, and then you notice when you're not right there, you feel better. So that was one of the reasons that we would just basically bounce these lines up and over our space. So I was teaching at a library and I forgot my staples. And so we found all these geomagnetic lines. And I was like, oh crap, we don't have staples. So I was like, okay, we're just going to do this without the staples. So we all had the intention of creating that bubble where they just went up and over and down and under, and it did, and it stayed. And so we were able to use consciousness to do that. And so that was an epiphany. So somebody was asking me to create these dowsing rods for them. Um, and uh, so I was like, okay, we're gonna make them out of sacred measures, and we're, we want to create an etheric template that is, brings it in so that when you use your rods, you're automatically clearing any of these geomagnetic lines that they're either clean and cleared that come through or else they are moved around. And the same with geopathic, which is like underground waterways, things like that, that we wanted to move these underground waterways, all this kind of stuff. So as Brenda and I were working on creating these etheric templates, and by the way, whenever we try to create these etheric templates, they never come out how I intend. Only once or twice have I had them come out the way the human intends. They always are different because my perception and my soul's perception are not the same usually. You know, I really, I'm trying to get there. So, um, so anyway, we were trying to create these dowsing rods and this ancient etheric tool came in, this golden, golden rod of light about this big is white and gold and, and it wasn't active. And so Brenda activated it and then it started to get all fuzzy because it was emitting sounds and other colors and it was just this wild thing. And we're like, wow, okay. So that's what we'll put into these dowsing rods. And this golden fire rod, or this golden light rod, I think we just call it, we found that it is older than this galaxy, maybe older than the universe, and it will clear timelines and realities for the person. It'll move and clear geopathic and geomagnetic lines and um, all kinds of other fun stuff. So we're like, okay, that's, that's what we put into our golden fire and light rods. And so, um, so that, was, that was finding that ancient etheric tool. We used to make meter rings, these rings that would go over top of your electrical meter because when they first came out with smart meters, people were having the effects of that because of the, the, the Wi-Fi transmissions and everything in there. But electrical meters are not good in the first place because between your fuse panel or your electrical meter, it doesn't matter if it's an analog or digital or whatever, it produces a field of electromagnetics that's about five and a half to six feet out from there and it's very discoherent. So when people sleep or spend a lot of time in those fields, it can affect you. You know, people get sensitivities to electromagnetics. Um, and so what we started to do was, um, so we took a meter ring and we were putting it over that, over the meter. And it was only affecting the transmissions of the meter. Because in there we had the frequencies and properties of all the plants, crystals, minerals, all that fun stuff. And it was transforming electromagnetics that were within here but we needed it to go throughout the whole electrical system. So we worked with the consciousness of electricity. Yeah, electricity has consciousness. So we worked with the consciousness of electricity as soon as we brought that into the rings. Then when we put the ring onto an electrical panel, it would follow that all the way back to your local transformer and connect to everybody. So we've had um, professional dowsers who come out and they'll take just one of our tiny little rings. We have um, a little ring that you can put onto your panel 
that little stick or else plug into the wall. And um, she found that when you put that onto one of those green transformer boxes that sits out on the, on the lawns or the kind that are up on the poles, you put that ring on there and before she measured that, it was in the negative thousands for on the dowsing scale of, of, of the energetics of that transformer and in the negative hundreds on your electrical panels. She put the ring on there, it changed that to positive hundreds and every electrical panel connected to there it changed it to a positive hundred as well. Positive hundreds. So it changes that entire electrical system. And so when you anchor a column of light into one of these huge transformer areas, that also is bringing through that consciousness of electricity. It's bringing through everything that the tools have into that column of light when we, when we get attuned to this. And then it affects everybody connected to that. 